Hi, I'm Dee Dee West, and this is Broken Limelight. If this is your first time listening, welcome. This is a podcast about true crime and dark stories about celebrities or those in the limelight like rock stars, writers, anybody famous. I am not a journalist or a psychologist or mental health professional of any kind. I am just an entertainer from Las Vegas who enjoys talking about true crime and has a lot of fun facts about celebrities. The reason I am saying all this is because I have a lot of listeners on YouTube who apparently don't realize that this is a podcast. So, if you're new, be forewarned, I do use a lot of profanity, I will laugh at my own jokes, and I'll probably sing at some point. Well, enough about me. Let's talk about John Lennon. John Lennon died on this day, December 8th, in 1980. He was born John Winston Lennon on October 9, 1940, to his mother Julia Stanley and his father Alfred Lennon. Alfred was a merchant seaman and he was actually away when John was born, which was common, he was often away from home. But he would regularly send paychecks to his wife in Liverpool. That was until 1944 when the checks stopped coming. When Alfred was away at sea, Julia would often leave John with her sisters and she would go out dancing. In 1942, she met a soldier named Taffy Williams, and by 1944, she had become pregnant with Taffy's baby. That relationship didn't work out, and when Alf came back to Liverpool in 1944, he actually offered to look after Julia, John, and Julia's unborn baby. But Julia apparently turned him down and told him that the relationship was over. In June of 1945, Julia gave birth to a baby girl named Victoria Elizabeth, after some pressure from her family, Julia actually gave Victoria up for adoption. John was actually never told about this sister. He found out about her, like, in the 60s when she reached out to him. In 1946, Julia started dating a guy named John Bobby Dykins. The two of them shacked up together in a tiny little flat that only had one bed. Julia's sister, Mimi didn't approve of this. She thought it was highly inappropriate that the couple and the baby be sleeping in the same bed. Er, he's like six at this point. Alfred Lennon also came back in 1946, and he didn't approve of this arrangement either. This led to the parents asking John to choose between which of his parents he wanted to live with. John reportedly chose his father, but when Julia started to walk away, he cried after her. They ultimately all agreed that Julia should be the one to care for him. So Alfred went back to the seas, and he didn't see John again for over 15 years. When they did get back in touch, John was at the height of Beatlemania and not very eager to get back in touch. So going back, Julia's sister Mimi told Julia bluntly that John sharing a bed with his mother and her new lover was not ideal, and she said, let him live with us, we can offer John a better life. However, John's half-sister Julia Baird said in her book, He was taken from our mother, and notice the word taken, not given up, torn away was more like it. So allegedly, Julia did try to fight Mimi on this, and her lover, Bobby Dykins, actually threw Mimi out of the flat, and she came back with an official from Liverpool Social Services. So eventually, Julia agreed to give John up to Aunt Mimi and her husband George, basically taking informal custody of John. Mimi's home was more stable, and they seemed to be affluent. Anyway, he's jumping from home to home and family member to family member, and it's said that this resulted in him becoming rebellious. He was a prankster, and he was kind of a smartass, and he was always getting into trouble. Julia would go and visit John as often as she could, and she was actually the one who got him into music and taught him how to play instruments, starting with the banjo and the piano. John and Julia would often sing together, and they would just bell out songs together at the top of their lungs. John became really interested in music, so she bought him his first guitar in 1956. Julia was very, very supportive of John, and John really thought that he could be famous, but Mimi did not agree. She had actually said, the guitar's all very well, John, but you'll never make a living out of it. In 1956, he formed the band The Quarrymen, which eventually would include Paul McCartney and George Harrison, and then that band would evolve into The Beatles in 1960. Ringo Starr would join the band in 1962. Paul McCartney had said that Aunt Mimi was very aware that John's friends were lower class, 
and she would often patronize him whenever he came over to their house. It's said, however, that Paul's father didn't approve of John either. He was vocal about how he thought John would get his son into trouble, but he was still very supportive of the band and let them all rehearse at his house. On July 15, 1958, when John was 17 years old, Julia went over to visit him. As she was leaving, she was headed to the bus stop to go home, and she was hit by a car while crossing the street. The driver of this car was a 24-year-old off-duty policeman named Eric Clegg. Clegg was not under the influence of anything at the time, and he was driving under the speed limit, which was something like 30 miles an hour. However, he was a student driver, and he was unaccompanied at the time. So here's a statement from John's childhood friend. His name is Nigel Wally. He said, I went to call for John that evening, but his Aunt Mimi told me he was out. Mimi was at the gate with John's mom, who was about to leave. We stood chatting, and John's mom said, Well, you have the privilege of escorting me to the bus stop. I said, That will do me fine. I'll be happy to do that. We walked down Menlove Avenue, and I turned off to go up Vale Road, where I lived. I must have been about 15 yards up the road when I heard a car skidding. I turned around to see John's mom going through the air. I rushed over, but she had been killed instantly. Nigel ran back to the house to get Mimi, and she came outside and just sobbed hysterically while they waited for an ambulance. Julia's husband, John Dykins, took John Lennon in a taxi, and they went to the hospital to go meet her there. When they got to the hospital, John was unable to look at his mother's body. At the funeral, he was absolutely devastated. Throughout the service, he laid with his head on his aunt's lap, just seeming completely oblivious to everything. His half-sister Julia would later say in her book, It was many years before he could bring himself to talk about that night. What he finally said was, An hour or so after it happened, a copper came to the door to let us know about the accident. It was awful, like some dreadful film where they ask you if you are the victim's son and all that. Well, I was, and I can tell you, it was absolutely the worst night of my entire life. John's mother, Julia, was only 44 years old. A post-mortem examination revealed that she had died of massive brain injuries caused by skull fractures. The coroner said that Mrs. Lennon did not appear to look either way before she walked into the road. I don't know how they can even tell that, but if that's something that can be verified, can somebody explain that to me? Because I would love to know. But whether or not she looked both ways before crossing the street, things were a little bit more complicated than that. Eric, the driver, was off-duty, and he was a learner driver, like a student driver, so he should not have been driving the car alone. He was later reprimanded by his superiors and suspended from duty for a short time. What I want to know is why he was driving in the car, if he really was, like, going against the rules, or if one of his bosses made him go drive and refused to accompany him. Anyway, there was an inquest held a month later, and they recorded a verdict of death by misadventure. Eric Clegg was acquitted of all charges. He never tried to contact Lennon's family to apologize or anything afterwards. He basically said that he didn't think it would help and it would just make things more difficult. When the Beatles became famous in 1964, it didn't take him very long to realize that the person who he had killed was the mother of John Lennon. It wasn't long before he decided to leave the police force and he took a job as a postman. Ironically, he ended up having to deliver fan mail to Paul McCartney's house. So he was still reminded every day kind of of what he had done. It took him decades to come forward and kind of reveal his identity as the person who had killed Julia Lennon. And therefore inspired quite a few works by John Lennon. Songs like Julia... Mother and My Mummy's Dead. He even named his first son Julian after her. John was quoted as saying, I lost her when I was a child of five and then again at 17. It made me very bitter inside. I had just begun to reestablish a relationship with her when she was killed. We'd caught up on so much in just a few short years. We could communicate. We got on. Chris Wally, who was the former band manager of the Quarrymen, he stated that John even tried to contact his mother through a seance after she died. John Lennon married his first wife, Cynthia Powell, in 1962 when she became pregnant with their son, Julian. They had met at the Liverpool College of Arts in 1957. John was reportedly a jealous guy by nature and eventually grew kind of possessive and angry, which in turn terrified Cynthia. She wrote a memoir called John, and in it she recalled that one time when they were dating, 
he struck her after he saw her dancing with Stuart Sutcliffe. She then ended the relationship until three months later when he apologized and asked her to come back. She took him back and she actually noted that he was never again physically abusive. However, he was still very verbally and psychologically abusive. John later said that it wasn't until he met Yoko Ono that he actually started to question his chauvinistic attitude towards women. He said that the Beatles song Getting Better actually told his own story. He said, I used to be cruel to my woman, and physically, any woman. I was a hitter. I couldn't express myself, and I hit. I fought men, and I hit women. That is why I'm always on about peace. His marriage began just as Beatlemania was taking off across the UK. The Beatles band manager, Brian Epstein, actually asked John to keep his marriage a secret because he was worried that fans wouldn't like it. So the Beatles really became whole when Ringo joined the band in 1962. Their first single, Love Me Do, was released in October 1962 and reached number 17 on the British charts. They recorded their debut album, Please Please Me, in under 10 hours on February 11, 1963, while John was actually suffering from a cold. And you can actually hear it if you listen to the last song recorded on that day, Twist and Shout. John and Paul started their songwriting partnership, Lennon-McCartney. John had said about that period, We were just writing songs, pop songs with no more thought to them than that, to create a sound, and the words were almost irrelevant. In an interview in 1987, Paul had said that he and the other Beatles idolized John. He said, He was like our own little Elvis. We all looked up to John. He was older and he was very much the leader. He was the quickest wit and the smartest. John, along with the other band members, were introduced to a drug called Preludin while they were touring in Hamburg. They would often take the drug as a stimulant during their long overnight performances. John started to become concerned about this whole Beatlemania thing and the fact that the fans who were attending the concerts were screaming so loud that you couldn't even hear the music. So he started to worry that the band's musicianship would suffer, that nobody was really listening to the, the music and the meaning of it, which was important. When they released the song Help, John said, I meant it. It was me singing Help. In March of 1965, John and George Harrison and their wives attended a dinner party, and apparently the guy who was hosting the dinner party, he spiked all of their coffees with LSD. This was apparently their first time trying LSD. I'm not positive about this, but have any of you guys seen Across the Universe? There's the song, I Am the Walrus, where they all go to a party and the punch was spiked. And then, like, it's pretty evident that they're, like, tripping out at this party. Anyway, I don't know if that's the connection, but it sounds like it. So anyway, the host of the party didn't actually tell them what they had taken until they were getting ready to leave. And he was like, I strongly advise you not to leave this house because of the effects that you're going to get pretty soon. Later on, they went to a nightclub and John said that they all thought it was on fire. Like they were actually screaming, thinking that they were on fire. In March 1966, John Lennon made a really controversial statement. He said, Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. We're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. That comment greatly offended people, particularly in the United States. People started, like, burning Beatles records and shit making threats against John Lennon, and supposedly this was one of the reasons that they stopped touring. In the mid-60s, John's use of LSD had increased a lot, and the themes of the Beatles songs were now way more psychedelic and deep than their earlier songs. The years 1966 to 1970 were known as the studio years. From late May to mid-October 1968, the group recorded what is now known as the White Album. Reportedly, it was during this time that tension started to build among the band members. The Beatles ended up traveling to the Maharishi's ashram in India for further guidance. A policeman didn't recognize Cynthia, so he stopped her from boarding. So John's wife had to stay behind, and she later recalled how this incident seemed to symbolize the end of their marriage. During the group's first trip to India in early 1968, John made up the song Dear Prudence. It was actually inspired by Mia Farrow's sister, Prudence Farrow. Prudence had become obsessed with meditating, and apparently she had locked herself in a closet. John and George Harrison tried to coax her out of the closet, 
which led to John making up the lyrics, singing her to come out and play. Ringo Starr had left the band for a couple weeks, reportedly due to some disagreements with the band, so they ended up recording back in the USSR and Dear Prudence as a trio without Ringo, and Paul McCartney actually filled in on the drums. John was starting to lose interest in collaborating with Paul McCartney at this point. Not to mention that Yoko Ono was also starting to come around at this time. And Brian Epstein died in 1967, so when that happened, there were a lot more disagreements about who was going to be their financial advisor and shit like that. John and Yoko actually met in 1966. He was invited by a mutual friend to go see her art show, and John and Yoko ended up continuing to write to each other for months afterwards. Yoko admitted that she was really attracted to John and she sent him a ton of postcards. Months later, John and Yoko collaborated on the Two Virgin sound collage and they became lovers. So yeah, John was still married to Cynthia and she was away on vacation in Greece. She came home and she walked in the house and found John sitting on the floor with Yoko wearing her bathrobe and they were just drinking tea and John just looked at her and said, Oh, hi. Cynthia, shocked and humiliated, left and went to stay with friends. In her book, she had stated, I was in shock. It was clear that they had arranged for me to find them like that, and the cruelty of John's betrayal was hard to absorb. I felt utterly humiliated and longed to disappear. Their intimacy had been so powerful that I had felt like a stranger in my own home. A few weeks later, Cynthia was informed that John was seeking a divorce and full custody of Julian. She received a letter saying that John was doing so on the grounds of her adultery. He accused her of having a relationship with an Italian guy named Roberto Bassanini, an accusation which she denied. She wrote, It was laughable. Roberto had been kind and a good friend, but I had never been unfaithful to John. It was his attempt to make himself feel better about what he was doing. After some negotiations, they came to an agreement. They got a divorce, and John gave her 100,000 pounds along with a small annual payment, and he allowed her to keep custody of Julian. Fun fact about Julian. When he was about four or five years old, he came home from school and he showed his dad a watercolor painting that he had made. He said it was just a painting of a bunch of stars and a little blonde girl that he knew from school. And John said, what's this? And he said, it's Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. John Lennon used that as inspiration for the Beatles song. A lot of people think that that song is about LSD and that Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds is supposed to be, you know, LSD. But John Lennon insists that it is not a song about acid. John and Yoko became inseparable throughout the later days of the Beatles. John had said, That old gang of mine, that's all over. When I met Yoko was when you meet your first woman and you leave the guys at the bar and you don't go play football anymore and you don't go play snooker and billards. You know the song, Those Wedding Bells Are Breaking Up That Old Gang of Mine? The old gang of mine was over the moment I met her. I didn't consciously know it at the time, but that's what was going on. As soon as I met her, that was the end of the boys. But it so happened that the boys were well known and weren't just the local guys at the bar. John and Yoko got married in 1969. On April 22, 1969, John changed his name, adding Ono as his middle name. So his official name was now John Winston Ono Lennon. John Lennon left the Beatles in September of 1969, but he agreed not to inform the media while the group renegotiated their recording contract. Paul McCartney ended up announcing his own departure while releasing his debut solo album in April 1970. This outraged John. His reaction was, Jesus Christ, he gets all the credit for it. I started the band, I disbanded it, it's as simple as that. He also said, I was a fool not to do what Paul did, which was to use it to sell a record. John also claimed that he, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr all got fed up with being sidemen for Paul. After Brian Epstein died, we collapsed, Paul took over and supposedly led us. But what is leading us when we went round in circles? That same year, John and Yoko formed the Plastic Ono Band, releasing Live Peace in Toronto 1969. Between 69 and 70, John released the singles Give Peace a Chance and Cold Turkey, which documented his withdrawal symptoms after he became addicted to heroin. And they also released the single Instant Karma. 
In the early 70s, the Nixon administration tried to deport John Lennon a bunch of times. See, John and Yoko were like public figures, and they were openly speaking about peace and against war, and the government was worried about how John would influence young voters. John spent years trying to sort out these legalities, but after Nixon left office, things kind of let up on him. In the early 70s, John and Yoko's relationship would start to suffer a little bit. It's been said that John was really, really needy, and sometimes Yoko wasn't so much as a partner as she kind of was his caretaker. It's said that Yoko wanted to hook up with somebody else and kind of suggested taking a break from John, a sort of separation, but she decided to give him a going away present first, a new girlfriend. So she mentioned May Pang. May Pang was a personal assistant of John and Yoko's. Yoko approached her and suggested that she should begin a physical relationship with John, telling her, he likes you a lot. She explained that they were kind of going through a separation and they had been arguing and growing apart, and that they agreed that John would start seeing other women and he was indeed sexually attracted to her. Peng was like, I could never start a relationship with my boss and he's married. Yoko just kept pushing and said that she would take care of everything. And Yoko's confirmed this in interviews. May was pretty shocked by the proposition, but she agreed to go out with John. The two were headed to Los Angeles for a weekend, which ended up becoming an 18-month period that they would later call the Lost Weekend. They went to Los Angeles, and while they were there, May encouraged John to reach out to his son Julian, who he hadn't seen for two years. John and Julian's relationship was obviously strained at this point. Reportedly, Julian was actually closer to Paul McCartney than he was to his own father. The song Hey Jude was actually Hey Jules originally. He wrote it for Julian during John and Cynthia's divorce to kind of try to comfort him. So John ended up visiting Julian and Cynthia, and they all went to Disneyland. After that, John and Julian started to see each other a bit more regularly. He also would buy his son a guitar and encourage him in his interest in music. John would later go on and have a child with Yoko, another son they named Sean. People like to say that Sean was like the favorite child. He was the child that John Lennon chose to love. In his own words, John says, Sean is a planned child and therein lies the difference. I don't love Julian any less as a child. He's still my son, whether he came from a bottle of whiskey or because they didn't have pills in those days. He's here, he belongs to me, and he always will. After John died, it was revealed that he had left Julian very little in his will. While John and May were in Los Angeles, John also rekindled some friendships with Ringo Starr, Paul McCartney, Harry Nilsson, and a few other people. While John was hanging out and drinking with Harry Nilsson, he apparently misunderstood something that Pang had said and he tried to strangle her. He only relented after Nilsson came over and physically restrained him. John and May went back to their penthouse apartment in Manhattan in June 1974. They also arranged a bedroom for Julian to sleep in when he went to visit them. By December, John and May had started to consider buying a house, and John stopped taking Yoko's phone calls. In January 1975, he agreed to meet up with Yoko, who claimed to have found a cure for smoking. So he went and met up with Yoko, and then afterwards, he failed to come home to May. He didn't call her or anything, he just cut her off and stopped talking to her. So May called the next day, and Yoko told her that John was unavailable because he was exhausted after a hypnotherapy session. Two days later, John appeared at a joint dental appointment. According to May, he was completely stupefied and confused to such an extent that she thought that he had been brainwashed. John told her that he and Yoko were back together, and he didn't want to see her anymore. May quietly met up with John a few times over the years, but they never got back together. In an interview, John was asked about his time with May, and he said, You know, I may have been the happiest I've ever been. I love this woman. I made some beautiful music, and I got so fucked up with booze and shit and whatever. So John and Yoko were back together, and they decided to try to have a baby. They had tried to get pregnant in the past, and unfortunately, they suffered multiple miscarriages. But this time, when she did get pregnant again, initially she said that she wanted to have an abortion. But she changed her mind and she allowed the pregnancy to continue on the condition that John adopt the role of house husband, which he agreed to do. John continued as a solo artist until about 1975, when their son Sean was born. 
John then took a break from music and he became a stay-at-home dad as he promised. During this break in his career, he created several series of drawings and he drafted a book containing a mix of autobiographical material and what he termed mad stuff. All of this work would be published after his death. In June of 1980, John Lennon chartered a 43-foot sailboat and embarked on a sailing trip to Bermuda. On the way, he and the crew encountered a storm, rendering everyone on board seasick, except for John, who took control and sailed the boat through the storm. This experience reinvigorated him and gave him a new creative spark, a new muse. He spent three weeks in Bermuda just writing and refining the tracks for the upcoming album. John came out from hiding in October 1980 when he released the single, Just Like Starting Over. In November, he and Yoko released the album Double Fantasy, which included some of the songs that John had written in Bermuda. It's crazy that he took control of this ship during a storm only to be murdered like a couple months later. Like, how do you survive that? So that brings us to December of 1980, the death of John Lennon. And this is where I'm going to end this episode. Here's the thing. In order to talk about John Lennon's death, we need to talk about John Lennon's killer, Mark David Chapman. So for more insight into this, I'm actually reading the book, Let Me Take You Down, Inside the Mind of Mark David Chapman, The Man Who Killed John Lennon. It's by Jack Jones. This book is based on more than 200 hours of interviews with Mark David Chapman and supported by interviews with his wife, former friends, therapists, with his permission, of course, and other people who he's confided in. With that said, I will come back here in a couple of days and tell you what I found out about Mark David Chapman and give you more of the details into John Lennon's death. Witnesses told police Lennon was shot near the door to his apartment building as he and Yoko Ono returned from a recording studio. At the hospital where Lennon was taken, young people prayed. He's not dead. John Lennon can't be dead. <laughs> Mark Chapman, charged with the murder of John Lennon, will be arraigned later this morning. All right. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please tell your friends. Leave me a positive review on Apple Podcasts or on BrokenLimelight.com. Don't forget, you can also read my sources on BrokenLimelight.com as well as see pictures, videos of interviews. I also have some pretty great merch. Just go check it out. It's fun. You might find out what the next episode to come is. Who knows? I don't know. Okay, well, I appreciate you so much. Don't forget to come back for part two. Until next time, bye bye Today's episode is brought to you by Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is a monthly mystery subscription box that's truly one of a kind. It's basically like a true crime case in a box. It comes with case files, codes to decipher, detailed backgrounds about the suspects and the victims. There's evidence for you to evaluate. It tells an immersive story of a whole crime case from beginning to end. It's kind of like an escape room in a box. You can do this by yourself, or you can team up with a buddy, or you can do it for like a game night or even a date night. You can take a little break from technology and immerse yourself fully into this box. Or if you prefer to be a more high-tech investigator, you can join online communities and talk to other Hunt a Killer players about clues and stuff. Hunt a Killer also shares part of the proceeds to the Cold Case Foundation, so your purchase actually helps with real-life cold cases. The best news is that Broken Limelight listeners get 20% off of their first subscription box. So go get started now at huntakiller.com and don't forget to use the code BROKENLIMELIGHT to get your 20% off. That's Broken Limelight, all one word.